This very week, nerds, is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing, when we first stepped foot on another celestial body. It is an amazing feat, half a century ago. What would happen if you actually stepped on the moon with your bare feet? The main point that makes the moon pretty much completely unlivable is that it has no atmosphere, it has no air, and heat uses air to transfer very effectively. Now, that's how fans work. A fan blows on you and some convection happens and heat leaves your body. But on the moon, heat does not leave the moon dirt or regolith, if you want to be a fancy science person. It doesn't leave the regolith very easily, so when it's in the sun or sunlight, it can get really really hot, and when it's not in the sun, it stays space cold. So we're talking something around 120 degrees Celsius over boiling in sunlight and negative 170 degrees Celsius in the shade of the moon. So if you actually stepped on the moon, but with your bare feet, it would be one small step for a man, a bunch of destroyed flesh for mankind. Welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, corrections, and questions, and I plant a flag of science in them and claim them with the sovereignty of me. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint, it's another problem I got with superheroes. Who would have thought? But getting right into it, in the last episode of Because Science, we were going through a thought experiment posed by a recent movie and novella called The Wandering Earth. And in that, they wanted to help Earth escape a dying sun. They wanted to take Earth and push it somewhere else. Yes, it is a SpongeBob reference when I say it. And I said, basically, you can watch the video, but it's completely implausible, if not totally impossible, with quote unquote, today tech. But what did you have to say? Well, I'm, I'm on a roll. Our first comment comes from Otis Zatz and Mason Mills and others who say, if we push Earth out of the solar system though, wouldn't just everything freeze and we'd just kind of all die anyway? It's kind of the same fate. Well, yes, if we weren't under the same influence of the sun, the Earth could turn into something like a snowball Earth, and then we wouldn't be able to live in the same way that we are living now. We'd probably have to live underground and find some other ways of creating heat, like geothermal heat, or, or just produce our own heat underground outside of the influence of the sun. And I will say, many of you watching the video probably haven't heard of this movie or this novella. I used it because it's a really cool thought experiment, but in it, it actually considers a lot. The Earth does get so cold, that everyone has to live underground. They live next to the giant Earth-moving engines because they produce heat. They have to slow down and stop the rotation of the Earth so the thrust is pointing in the right direction. They think about a lot of good science in the film and the novella, so you're right on the money. Random Chaos and Insight says, Hey Kyle, what do you think would happen if someone somehow managed to exceed the speed of light while in outer space? Point number A. You can't go faster than the speed of light if you have mass. It's just a thing. The universe doesn't want that to happen, or so it seems like. But if you could, point number B, you would be able to travel backwards in time. You could go outside of your light cone, so to speak. If you want to know what that is, go back to our episode on the Avengers Endgame timeline. You would go outside of your light cone and you could go to your own past. But before any of that would happen, if you could travel at the speed of light through space, space is not completely empty and you'd start running into the lonely particles that are out there, like little hydrogen particles that are floating around just very sparsely. You'd hit them so quickly, it would act like ionizing radiation, and you'd die in less than a second. That's my random insight. <laughs> <laughs> Amy Patil, or something similar, says, Hey Kyle, if, what if we make an artificial planet like a spacecraft, but fill it with all the artificial resources that are the same as Earth? Now, it probably won't be a surprise to you to think that that is a much bigger undertaking than just strapping a bunch of rockets to the surface of the Earth. And I will say that what makes life on Earth possible, most of the machinery that makes everything we know possible, is basically invisible to us. You can't just say, oh, we're going to bring some plants 
because the plants need an ecosystem and that ecosystem needs refueling. It needs uh, things to die, things to be born, uh, soil recycling, a water cycle, atmospheres, everything that makes your life possible right now. Out of all of it, 99% of it is invisible or what have you, the majority of it. All of the geological processes, all the trillions and trillions of food webs and interactions between organisms that make the life up here on the surface possible. We don't see any of that. So to make a real Earth like we know and love, you would have to replicate pretty much all of it, not just artificially produce some resources. You'd have to artificially reproduce probably some version of the geology and the atmosphere and all of this, and all of that would be much harder than just getting a big old rocket and thrusting. William Hull and others have an interesting comment that I get all the time. Uh, William says, I'd like to say something clever, but that necklace of yours looks very much like a Y incision, like what you do when you give someone an autopsy, how you cut into their chest cavity, and it's freaking me out! Seriously, even the shadow it casts under the studio lights... What? I don't know what you mean. Make it seems like you have a flesh incision and what is this? Because zombie? <laughs> what, this thing? It can't be a, a Y incision. I've been dead for years. Am I a zombie? Feels like it. Although, like a zombie, I am still interested in your brains. Yes. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this video, I gotta give to Cinna. Yep. Who says instead of butchering it, who says, hey Kyle, you can use solar sails to accelerate Earth away, accelerate Earth away from the sun. But in this scenario, you would need a sail with the surface area of about, whoa, uh, that's a lot of square meters, which is 600,000 times the surface area of one hemisphere of Earth, four with 19 zeros after it. You would need a circular light sail with a radius of 3.6 millione, it's the Italian version of million, uh, kilometers, which is nearly 600 times the radius of Earth. So it doesn't matter what method you're going to use, it really is really, really, it's really improbable. Thanks for the video, it is so cool. <laughs> you know what, Cinna? I totally agree with you. No, there's many different ways to thrust, but no matter which way you pick, it's all gonna be difficult. At least your first time. I'm talking about rockets! <laughs> Your parents get it, ask them. But for doing the math yourself, Cinna, which I always appreciate, and giving us a little bit of your own interestingness, you are indeed a super nerd. Ah! Running out of gestures. But of course, I'm not always right. I almost never know where I am geographically in relation to other things. I, I have no idea where I am. Oh yeah, just go, you know, just go a little, a little bit north and you, you can't miss it. What do you mean? I don't know. So what did I get? I, I really don't. So what did I get wrong last week? Where am I? Our first correction comes from Steven Penderson who says, look, I'm no scientist, huh, but I play one on the internet. But my gut tells me that all those rockets would destroy our atmosphere. Am I right? Am I wrong? Well, yes, in our conception of this wandering Earth scenario, you wouldn't just strap all the rockets to the surface of Earth and just push it. You would have to have the kind of infrastructure, which we didn't even consider, that basically you'd have to construct giant pylons and put the engines on the end of them such that they were outside or mostly outside of Earth's atmosphere. So you can think of like an entire hemisphere of Earth filled with a forest of scaffolding and at the end of those, 100 kilometers straight up are engines pushing on the Earth's surface, which would create tremendous pressure, might crack stuff. Uh, it would be absolutely crazy. You would not, as you say, want to have it burning within the atmosphere, not getting the same thrust. You'd heat up everything and eh, we're trying not to die by heat. Oh, we are. We really are, though. Lazy Plankton says, how about using Jupiter to slingshot Earth out of the solar system? Maybe use some large asteroids to change the trajectory of Earth? Again, I will say that uh, the movie and the novella does get a lot right. We were considering a very general case because outside of the general case, it gets very complicated. Orbital mechanics is hard and I'm not an expert. So we consider just the base level case of pushing the earth out of the solar system. But in the wandering earth, all iterations of it, they do use Jupiter as a gravitational slingshot to help them leave the solar system. They do do that. So this isn't even really a correction if you think about it. Our next correction comes from Connor Sturgeon, Hagen, Gideon, and others who have 
have a common misconception about how these kind of calculations are done. I'm not saying you're missing something or you're dumb or anything. This is very common and I want to clear it up because it's very interesting, especially in rocket science. So uh, many of you are saying, well, would you actually need less of the Earth itself as fuel as you were traveling through space? Because if the Earth was getting lighter and lighter, you wouldn't have to push on it as hard, right? So the thrust could come down. Let's just think about how that analysis would start. We are talking about a time-dependent thing where over time, the variables are changing, but you need to come to a conclusion based on the entirety of that time. Well, there's a process you can go through to do those kinds of time-oriented equations, and in this case, case, it's calculus. And if you use calculus, you can come to a simple looking equation, the rocket equation, that actually involves a lot of assumptions on the back end. It looks simple, but it actually does consider how over time, how much fuel you need based on what you start with and what you end with. It does take into account how the thrust, how the change in velocity goes down as you get lighter and lighter. So the rocket equation, like we used in the episode, does account for this correction. Oh, we got one more from Paul. Cochran, who says maybe instead of stopping the Earth's rotation to thrust it out of the solar system, we could turn it on its axis, on it is axis, to stabilize our flight. There, problem solved. Wrong. Why does something need to be stabilized in flight with some kind of rotation? Think about it. What is pushing on that thing that would wobble it out of its path? Well, on Earth, we stabilize things with rotation like bullets because of air resistance. In space, there be no air you would not have to stabilize the Earth in that way. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this video comes from Dutch Hendrik, who says, so if you were standing on the side of a planet with the rockets, wouldn't the gravity seemingly be less there and vice versa if you're standing on the other side of the planet? Using the numbers and acceleration for the video, I calculated that Earth's acceleration from the rockets would be greater than the current acceleration just from Earth's gravity. So really, instead of mild changes in gravity, you'd either fly off the Earth or get violently crushed. I don't mean to sound like the internet, but well, actually, if you do run the numbers, you find that even if you are changing the Earth's velocity in this very substantial way, you can do it over a period of time where the acceleration isn't actually all that much. Me and OG super nerd Matterbeam ran some numbers and the acceleration is a few millijes, so a few thousands of a G, but that would be added on to the acceleration due to Earth's gravity on one side of the planet as if you were in an elevator that was rapidly going upwards. So on one side of the planet, if you had this rocket situation, you would be heavier and that would actually happen. Oh jeez, <laughs> am, am I on the non-rocket side of the planet or <laughs> do I just feel big today? Is that what people say? I don't know, I never try on clothes. Interestingly, and I don't want to talk about them at length, but interestingly, this kind of scenario is what flat earth people say is happening. They say that Earth is flat and it doesn't have the gravity that we think it does because it's actually a disk accelerating upwards at exactly 9.81 meters per second per second. They're wrong in that the Earth is flat. It is obviously not. But they are correct in that if the Earth was being pushed upwards at some acceleration, you would feel weight. And in our situation, you'd feel even more weight. So for considering that, which I didn't even think about, Dutch, you're indeed a super nerd. Oh, jeez. Whoa. Is there extra gravity in here? And now, of course, we move on to the award-winning segment of what's coming up next on Because Science. What's coming up next on Because Science, of course, is superheroes are saving us the wrong way. That's right, in the next episode of Because Science, I got another, yet another bone to pick with superheroes if they've ever tried to save anyone who is falling from a height, like off a building or a bridge or anything. They are catching us, they are saving us in the wrong way. They are gonna do more harm than good, and I have the physics-approved way to save someone if you are. Are, mm, a soups. So stay tuned. And you know what? Go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet. And leave me all of your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter, brah. And if I saw you at VidCon, you came up and fist bumped me because it's more hygienic and hey, I don't want to touch you. Thank you so much for saying hello. It means the world to me, even the whole earth, rockets and all. This is why, this is why we do it. And if you're going to San Diego Comic-Con, 
I will be there. You can fist bump me there too. Don't touch me. But you can come and watch me talk about sciencey stuff on Sunday on a panel about Spider-Man using new science from the new movie. And you can watch me moderate the Expanse panel for Amazon on Saturday afternoon. Whoo! There's going to be a lot of thrusting on that panel as well because of the rockets. Not. Who's ready? <laughs> Beltas, where you at? And don't forget. Happiness and satisfaction with your life are not exactly the same thing all the time. So I just, I just read some interesting research by maybe the world's most influential psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote a fantastic book called Thinking Fast and Slow, if you're interested in reading about this kind of thing. But he and his colleagues once did a study that found that money can't buy happiness, it buys something else. So about up to $75,000 a year, as you increase up to that salary or what have you, you get happier and happier. But beyond that, you don't get happier at all, no matter how much you're making above that limit. But what you do get is life satisfaction. You stop getting happier, but you do feel more satisfied and successful in your life, which could be its own kind of fulfillment. So money can't buy happiness, but it's still pretty good. <laughs>